Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of my subscriber special review marathon, starting with Helsing. Before I begin my review, I want to say this. Considering I have read a bit of the manga this series is based on, I will say you only see me look at it on its own merits, considering how much it deviates from the source material. In fact, I would say it has to be viewed as its own thing for that reason alone. Also, as a fair warning, there will be spoilers to Helsing, Though, since this anime is almost 20 years old, I'm sure not many people will take offense to that. Now, with that said, let's talk about this series, shall we? So the plot follows a group known as the Helsing Organization, which pretty much exterminates monsters like ghouls and vampires that threaten the United Kingdom. There, we are introduced to the top agent of the Helsing Organization, who just so happens to be a vampire named Alucard, played by Crispin Freeman the English dub, and Joji Nakata, hope I'm pronouncing his name right, in the Japanese version, where after a mission in Cheddar, Alucard shot through a police girl named Sarah's Victoria, played by KT Gray in the English dub, and Fumiko Orikasa in the Japanese version in order to eliminate his target, and turn Sarah's into a vampire. As the series progresses, we see that someone has been making these computer chips that makes artificial vampires, as well as a vampire named Incognito. Now we're left to question, will the Helsing organization discover who's been making these artificial vampires, and how can they stop Incognito? That's all the plow mentioned, so now it's time for me to explain what I liked about Helsing, what I did not like about Helsing, some trivia, and my overall opinion. So what did I like about Helsing? The dubbing is for the most part pretty good for the time. I say for the most part because I'll come back to some of the performances later. One advantage I could say it has over the Japanese version is they give a lot of the characters accents, which considering it's set in the United Kingdom, that makes perfect sense. And the fact they actually have people from England like Victoria Harwood as Integra Helsing and Ralph Lister as Walter Dormais is a big plus. But I feel the actor who steals the show in the dub is Crispin Freeman as Alucard, who I feel was perfect casting. Something about his performance gives Alucard a bit of suave to the character, while also being excellent at making him sound sadistic and psychotic. It also helps that I dig some of the dialogue in this series. Of course, there are other people I could mention, like J.B. Blanc as the head of the Iscariot and Rico Maxwell, Stephen Brand as Alexander Anderson, Patrick Sates as Luke Valentine, and even Isaac Singleton as the main antagonist of the series Incognito. But honestly, outside of saying they all play their parts well, there isn't much I can really say that wouldn't be repetitive. While I think the series is better suited dubbed because of the setting, that doesn't mean I think the Japanese version is bad or anything, because it's fine in its own right. Like with Crispin Freeman, Joji Nakata gives a very commanding presence as Alucard, or if you want to go by the pronunciation of the Japanese version, Arucard. Whenever he is on screen, he has an, again, attention-grabbing presence, like when he belittles the fake vampires for the stuff they've been doing to other people. Yoshiko Sakakibara, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, did a good job giving the needed authority in her voice as Integra, and I can buy the interaction she has with Motomu Kiyokawa as Walter in the sense of them knowing each other for years. Now, there are several others I could mention, like Fumiko Orikasa as Sarah's Victoria, Takumi Yamazaki as Incognito, and the late Nachi Nozawa's Alexander Anderson, but honestly, just like with the dub, there is not much I can really add on their performance, outside of they play their parts well for the most part. The music by Yasushi Ishii, hope I'm pronouncing his name right, is really good. The jazzy tone it has helps give the series its own identity, and this even ties it to its opening and closing song. It just makes it feel all cool. The opening especially with its use of pianos, Honestly, it's something I don't mind listening to, it's so well done. That said, I found one music track odd, where it sounded like I heard Godzilla War sound effects in the background for no real reason, which I think was a weird choice. It's not enough to call it a negative per se, but something I noticed. The animation is a mixed bag for me. Like, some of it I'll save for later, but there are times where it's decently fluid by television standards of the time, with a notable example for me being the first fight between Alucard and Alexander Anderson. That particular scene did move somewhat natural for me as far as the series evolving vampires go. And with the character models, for the most part, don't seem to go off model too bad. 
Except for the next time sequence, which involves the spirit thing, and we'll get to that soon. Lastly, the story, up until the ending, while it is very flawed, I did find to be entertaining and some elements I actually liked. I was interested in them trying to figure out who created these vampire chips, let alone what did they hope to accomplish with those things. While I will mention where it leads to later, it did keep my attention at least. I also liked some small details like how after the Valentine brothers attacked the compound, they had a funeral for those that died. While that was again small, I liked how we saw the aftermath or consequences of what we saw previously, especially when it came to the decision several characters made. Now while I think this series has some moments that people don't give it credit for, let's talk about what I didn't like about Helsing, since there is a lot to talk about. When it comes to the animation, while it sometimes looks fine by TV standards, other times it looks rather bad. One example is this scene of Integra walking in the first episode. The way it's animated, you'd think she had a stick literally up her butt because nobody walks like that. Not to mention, and these might be seen as nitpicks, something about the color palette they use feels kind of bland to me, and when it comes to the backgrounds, sometimes it just makes me think that we are just in the same place, which I know you can argue it's set in one country, but even so, that is a problem considering how much they could have added or make it stand out even more. Furthermore, the preview for the next episode is especially cringeworthy. I get it's arguably more comedic, but when it comes to the character models of that spirit and the characters, that's when the animation is at its worst. On top of that, I have noticed animation errors. For example, in the third episode, a vampire is going on a killing spree, and after the machine gun he stole ran out of bullets, a police officer shoots him before said vampire kills that officer. Not that I'm excusing it, but this would have been one thing if that error was just for that scene, and it doesn't happen for the rest of the series. But no, it even happens after one of the Valentine brothers, Yawn, is shot while him, his brother, and their army of ghouls are attacking the Helsing Mansion, where either he or his clothing sustain some level of damage, then all of a sudden, it's like they regenerate or something, which, in these two examples, neither one of them have anything that can heal them from that, so it makes me wonder if Gonzo had a limited budget to begin with, or what? Especially since this doesn't happen to the other freak vampires throughout the entire series. While a dub is overall fine, if I had to pick out one person in the main cast that is the weakest, I would say it'd have to be KT Gray as Sarah's Victoria. Now don't get me wrong, she is not god-awful in the role, but her line delivery in some scenes to me came off as rather flat, and when she screams someone's name considering it's meant to be a big deal, and I don't know if this could be attributed to a lack of experience or what, but I never get that punch in the gut feeling when that does happen. On top of that, there was a minor character who you could tell was trying to do an English accent, and it is pretty bad. And the fact she was sharing the screen with someone who actually is from England, that makes it more noticeable. There are other minor characters too, like Integra's uncle, who maybe 10 or more years ago might have been considered good, but nowadays it doesn't age well, with a major example being when they discover Alucard for the first time. Given the scene, you would think the character would be in a state of panic, but the line delivery comes off as him sounding more nonchalant than someone who is about to crap his pants. That's not to say the Japanese version is flawless either. Some of the reactions the secondary characters give to me were not as strong as they could be. I don't have as much to say about this as I do about the dub, because I think it was a case of maybe it needed a retake or two. Lastly, when it comes to how the story is presented, I have some major problems. First is with how they implemented the Vatican group of vampire hunters known as the Iscariot Organization, or lack of them. Sure, after the first time Alexander Anderson attacks Alucard, they do touch on that later with a scene between Integra and their leader, Enrico Maxwell. But then after the second time Alexander Anderson and Alucard met, it amounts to nearly nothing. And it's disappointing because they really could have done so much more with that, including showing how the tension would be at an all-time high between the two factions after this ordeal. How the Iscariot could be planning something, stuff like that. But no, you just see Anderson briefly during the final fight with Incognito, and that's it. I get they aren't the main antagonist, Incognito is, 
but just like with something I'll mention later, it makes it feel like watching just about everything about the Iscariot is meaningless because in the grand scheme of things, it really amounts to nothing outside of Alucard having a new gun, which considering how much this strays from the source material, they could have come up with a million different ways for that to happen. Next, we have the main villain, Incognito. Interestingly enough, when I first saw him, I thought he was a decent villain in the sense of he seemed to be an alright threat to Alucard in terms of power and or abilities. But having said that, looking at it nowadays, he is just uninteresting, not just as a villain, but also as a character in general. Now again, this is not because he isn't in the original source material. I am fine with them creating characters just for the anime. But even in the context of the anime, there's no real reason given as to why he was using the freak vampire chips, let alone what his endgame was. Plus, I felt he was introduced far too late into the series to really leave or have much of an impact on the story. No joke, he was introduced at episode 8, out of a 13 episode long series. I'm not saying he should have been introduced in episode 1, but I feel there was more they could have done with him. Not just as a character, but also they could have set him up better before his reveal considering nearly everything around him felt terribly rushed. But now we come to what I think hurts this series the most. The ending straight up sucks. First, they mention how Incognito is serving someone, much like how Alucard serves Integra, which I think was an interesting idea. But it wasn't executed well because it was introduced at the third to last episode, and prior to that, if I remember correctly, they never even remotely hinted at that. To me, that was something they really should have revealed, as well as the character much earlier, as it felt like a case of too little too late for that revelation to have any real weight behind it, much less payoff. What makes this even worse is after the final fight between Alucard and Incognito, they show a text saying the traitor and the round table had been secretly judged in silence, which you could say is Integra, but they never reveal who Incognito was serving at all, and MI5 is looking for the party responsible for the freak vampire chips. Here's the biggest problem I have there. They spent so much time trying to figure out who create these chips, let alone what they hope to accomplish with those things, and it feels like a case of poor writing to spend that much screen time just to go absolutely nowhere with it. I know you could argue Incognito created them, but you only see one scene of him using it on someone, which doesn't mean he created it, just that he used them once. It just makes watching the whole show feel completely pointless because it doesn't lead to anything. And I don't know what went wrong behind the scenes, but ending an entire series like that feels downright insulting to me and leaves the experience unfinished. Now for some trivia. Helsing is very loosely based on the manga of the same name by Kota Hirano. Most of the deviations has to do with the strict standards of what is acceptable for TV, as well as some of the sequences in the manga would have been very costly. According to IMDb, the character of Alexander Anderson is based on Edward Van Sloan, who some of you might know played Van Helsing in the 1931 film adaptation of Dracula, and the gigantic gun that Sarah's Victoria wields is named after the villain in Dune. The director of the anime adaptation was Umanosuke Ida, hope I'm pronouncing his name right, who was involved in several projects, including being an in-between animator for Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, the assistant director of Castle in the Sky, and was even the director of the 1987 and 1990 OVA adaptation of Devilman. Some of the other roles the dub cast wrote includes Crispin Freeman, who I'm sure many of you would recognize best as Itachi Uchiha from Naruto, Jeremiah Galkwald from Code Geass, and interestingly enough, just like his Japanese counterpart, also played Kirei Kultamine in the Fate franchise, J.B. Blanc, who played numerous roles in Naruto like Pakun and Sasori's human puppet Hiroko, Bane in Batman Arkham Origins, and most recently you can hear him as Kano in Mortal Kombat 11. Lastly, we have Patrick Sates, who some of the roles you might have heard him as includes Frankie in One Piece, Dio Brando in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and Germany in Hitalia. As for the Japanese version, we have Joji Nakata, who, like I said earlier, just like Crispin Freeman, plays Kirei Kotamine in the Fate franchise, M. Bison in the Street Fighter 2 animated movie, and Deedhard from Code Geass. 
Fumiko Orikasa, who is Ruki Akuchiki from Bleach, Shirley from Code Geass, and Chun Li from Street Fighter V. The last person I'll mention here is Hideyuki Tanaka, who played D in Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, Yusako Kudo in Case Closed, and Otakon in the Metal Gear Solid franchise. Overall, Helsing I don't think is quite as bad as what some people made it out to be, but having said that, I don't think it's that good either. While the voice acting is good by the main cast, had some interesting ideas with Incognito, even if it wasn't handled well, and entertainment value, it doesn't excuse the at times terrible animation, less than stellar voice acting by minor characters, and that god-awful ending which really sours the experience for me, because like I said earlier, it makes watching the entire series feel like a complete waste of time. It doesn't really go anywhere, nor does it feel satisfying in any way. Not even in terms of endings that'll make you think, or is left open to your interpretation. As far as a recommendation goes, at best it's worth streaming, especially if you have no knowledge of the source material it's based on. But I don't think it's worth owning a copy of, and fans of the source material will more than likely hate this version. But as a standalone series, I think this series is slightly above average, which is a shame given the talent involved. I give Helsing a 6 out of 10. This has been Michael Schomer, and not only do I want to see what your opinions of Helsing is in the comments down below, but also, if you want to see reviews before they are made public, then visit my website at shomesreviews.com, and if you want to request a review for me in the future, then feel free to donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash shomes. Hi, I'm Brittany Karbowski. I'm a voice actress for both Funimation and Sentai Filmworks, and I hope you enjoy this video review by Michael Schomer. Hello everyone and welcome to my review of Helsing Ultimate. For those that have not seen my review of the original Helsing anime, fear not, the link to it will be in the description. Also, like with the original Helsing, while I have read a bit of the manga it's based on, this review is what I thought of it as a standalone series. Not how faithful it is to said manga, which, to be fair from what I read, it is. Also, like I said in my intro to this stage in my long 1,000 plus subscriber specials, which I'll put the link to in the description, you will not see me talk about Team Four Stars A Bridge series, because, while it's a well done parody, it's not an official version of this series. Now with that said, let's talk about the series, shall we? So, the story actually starts off showing how Integra meets Alucard when her uncle tries to assassinate her so he could take control of the Helsing organization. We then cut to a few years into the future where Integra, played by Victoria Harwood in the dub, and Yoshiko Sakikabara, hope I pronounced her name correctly in the Japanese version, sends Alucard, played by Crispin Freeman in the dub, and Joji Nakata in the Japanese version, to the English town of Cheddar where he shoots through Sarah's Victoria, played by KT Kray in the dub, and Fumiko Orikasa in the Japanese version, in order to take out the vampire that has caused trouble in that town, and turns her into a vampire. As the series progresses, we discover that someone has been making artificial vampires, which is thanks to a mysterious group known as Millennium. The last battalion of Nazis that survived World War II, who are mostly vampires, and want to start a war with everybody. So we are left to question how can the Helsing organization defeat Millennium, and maybe even the Iscariot organization. That's all the plow mentioned, so now let's talk about what I liked about Helsing Ultimate, what I did not like about this series, some trivia, and my overall opinion. Talking about the things I liked, right off the bat, the animation is a vast improvement over the original series. Which I know you might be saying, well, no duh, the first episode came out like five years after the original anime. And that may be true, but it's also impressive considering there is something regarding what company, or in this case, companies, made Helsing Ultimate that I'll go into when discussing trivia. The way it uses shadows where sometimes the character's eyes and or glasses shines through not only works from a stylistic perspective, but also I feel like it really does add to the atmosphere. Plus, outside of the tiniest of nitpicks I'll bring up later, none of the characters really go off model. It's just with the animation, a lot of work went into it, and it shows. 
The voice work from the dub not only is really good, but also is a lot better than the dub of the original Helsing. And between this and the Japanese version, I think is the better of the two versions, in large part because of its setting. Obviously, major praise goes to the directing and in several episodes writing by Talos and Jaffe, who really nailed the weight several scenes had, and even the comedic scenes really worked. Crispin Freeman is once again fantastic as Alucard, making him sound incredibly psychotic. Not only that, but he actually made the character feel more human, with a good example being Episode 9 where we see his backstory. For obvious reasons, I can't show much of it given the content they show, but how they went about it, as well as how the story unfolds, does make him more fleshed out, and the performance is a big factor behind that. Victoria Harwood gives Integra more of an authority presence than in the original series. Part of it might have to do with how far dubbing anime has come in the sense of a lot of the actors since then have become more seasoned. And as far as I know, that field has been taken more seriously than it was in the early 2000s. One scene I can easily give as an example that shows this is in the first episode when she mentions how she's explaining what happens when a deflowered person is bitten by a vampire, therefore one is running around cheddar, and this random bureaucrat laughs off the very idea that a vampire could be there causing all this trouble, and she tells him off before going into what the Helsing organization does. The way the scene plays out and is delivered really shows right off the bat that she's dealt with these monsters for some time. Even though I thought she was kind of weak in the original series, KT Cray was much better as Sarah's Victoria this time around. She handled the turmoil in her new life as a vampire well, plus her development as the series progressed is very striking and she really brought out the change Sarah's goes through. One scene I thought was very well acted on her end was after Zorn tortured her both mentally with something that happened in her past, which, like with Alucard's backstory, I won't show much of for obvious reasons, and physically, like cutting off her arm, paralyzing her with a blow to her spine, and blinding her with her massive scythe, as well as how Zorn kept referring to Pip as stuff like a gnat after mortally wounding him and she became a full-fledged vampire to make Zorn pay. Every bit of emotion in that scene, she really brought her A-game, and not only was it believable, but it was also very easy to be invested in. The last person I'll mention is Goodhart Jackson as the Major. It'd be easy to say he did a German accent well and leave it at that, but he does an amazing job at making the Major a memorable villain. One example was the major speech and how he loves war and the sheer chaos that you see in it. The entire scene, I was glued to the screen because of how despicably evil the major was. And despite how you feel about the character itself, the voice work is what really sold it for me. There are other people I could mention like Kari Walgren as Rip Van Winkle, Patrick Seitz as Luke Valentine, Stephen Brand as Alexander Anderson, and even J.B. Blanc as Enrico Maxwell, but honestly, I thought the cast overall was fantastic, and to say why I think so would not only take way too long, but also I feel like it would get repetitive. Now while I think, like with the original anime, this is a case where the dub suits this series better because of the setting, and that they give accents to the characters who are canonically from a specific country, that doesn't mean the Japanese version is horrible either. On the contrary, I think it's good in its own right. Just like with the original anime, Joji Nakata as Arukard is fantastic. One scene in particular I thought was acted fairly well is during the first episode when he talks to Ceres about she needs to visualize she has a third eye since she's no longer human so she could take out her vampiric target. Plus, just like Crispin Freeman in the dub, Joji Nakata gives the character a demented side to his personality. I quite dig Norio Wakamoto, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, as Alexander Anderson, who is a very fine successor to the late Naichi Nozawa in the role. I really think he brought out the hint of madness in his performance. The obvious example being when he first runs into Arakard, where he basically admits he wants to enjoy the hunt when he is targeting Arakard and Cirrus, much less when it's revealed he has a regenerator. The way the lines were delivered was quite good. Plus, he did a very fine job at giving weight to Alexander Anderson's character development, especially when he used Helena's nail to try and defeat Arukard. 
There are other people I could mention, like Fumiko Orikasa as Sarah's Victoria, but Tomo Kiyokawa, hope I pronounced his name correctly, as Walter Dormez, and even Noburo Tabita, hope I pronounced his name correctly, as the Major, but there's not a whole lot I can really say other than they are solid. When it comes to the action sequences, I have to say it right now, it's far more violent than the original series, and if you can't stomach a copious amount of blood, then this series is not for you. Now having said that, I think it's very well done. It's super over the top and gratuitous, but in this case it adds to the overall entertainment value of this series. You definitely get a sense at how superhuman these vampires are. Obviously we have the whole war and individual fights like Ceres versus the Captain. The score by Hayato Matsuo is good overall, but I feel for a different reason than in the original anime. While the original series had more of a jazzy tune, this series is more operatic, using more choir and percussion instruments. Considering how massive this series is in scope during the entire war in London, it complements the scenes very well. Lastly, the overall story, even though it's completely bonkers, is still very entertaining, and I will give them credit for actually doing their research when it comes to history that you may not have picked up on. One example that you might not even notice was in one scene the Major while he was making his speech on how he loves war, as well as in episode 5 when they pull out their books, made a reference to Operation Sea Lion, which for those that don't know was the Nazis' planned attempt to invade the United Kingdom in 1940, but never happened. Considering the bulk of the story is centered around the war in London, it was at least engaging. And while the ending isn't perfect, I found it leagues more satisfying than the original anime. For the sole reason that with the original anime, they spent so much time having the characters try and figure out who made these vampire chips and why, only for it to just about go nowhere with it. Whereas here, at least the series feels finished. Like it doesn't feel like they needlessly left any major plot threads hanging with no conclusion. Plus, they gave more weight to some of the characters' backstories. One example that, again, I can't show much of for obvious reasons, was Zora Blitz tormenting Sarah's Victoria by showing her the memory of her parents getting murdered by a bunch of robbers, which was horrifyingly effective. Lastly, while I don't have much to say, I feel like when it comes to the dub, at least I have to give praise to both Talison Jaffe and Patrick Seitz for the script adaptation, because I feel like a lot of the dialogue really worked here, and they did a good job at having it fit the setting it's in. Now when it comes to the cons, I only have two things that I can say, though I don't think it really hurts the series overall, and one of them is a massive nitpick. I've heard people describe this show as focusing on the here and now, and it's kind of true. Most of the OVA follows the war in London, and characters' backstories are only shown for a few minutes. Now that's not to say no character development happens in this series because it totally does. However, if you're expecting completely deep characters, you might be left disappointed. This is more minor I'll freely admit is a gigantic nitpick on my end. While the animation as a whole is really good, sometimes, especially in more comedic scenes, it looks more lower grade, which isn't always a bad thing necessarily except in a few occasions it happens right after a dramatic moment, which can be seen as jarring. Like this scene where after they make an emotional scene after Alucard shot through Ceres in order to get this vampire priest, and how it appears she is dying, only to then be shown of Ceres running away from some zombies in the same way you would see in an old episode of Scooby-Doo. I consider it a nitpick because it's not a constant thing throughout the series, nor does it hurt the series in any major way. Now for some trivia. I'm sure this is a no duck kind of deal for a lot of people, but originally this series and the original anime was licensed by Genion until they shut down in 2007, and sometime after that Funimation would get the rights to both series. The animation was done by not one, not two, but by three different studios. Episode 1 through 4 was done by Statelight, who you might know for animating series like Macross, the first 175 episodes of Fairy Tale, and Log Horizon. Episodes 5 through 7 was done by Madhouse, who has done a lot of different series or movies. But to name three, you might know them for doing season one of One Punch Man, Death Note, and Black Lagoon. 
Lastly, the final three episodes were done by Graphenica, I hope I pronounced the studio correctly, who you might know for doing Junie Tyson's Zodiac War and Record of Ragnarok. According to the audio commentary, the sound whenever Alucard unleashes the Hound of Baskerville is a mix of Crispin's own voice and crying babies. Plus, the song the Major was singing in the Japanese version is the opening to Fist of the North Star. Also, the costume that Penwood Sr. is wearing when Integra is making up how courageous he was and how she lost her eye was a reference to an anime called Legend of the Galactic Heroes. As far as the dub goes, there were two different voice actors for Zorn Blitz. In episode 4, she was played by Helena Taylor, best known for portraying Bayonetta in the Bayonetta video game franchise. But then from that point on, she was played by Rachel Robinson, who you might know as the voice of Young Feng in Final Fantasy XIII. From what the commentary track said, it seemed like the reason in this case was because Helena Taylor moved back to England, so they had to recast. The director for the first four episodes is Tomokasu Tokoro, who you might know for directing Haibei Renmei, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Nae Under 7, again I hope I pronounced it correctly, and Season 2 of The Seven Deadly Sins, referred to as Signs of Holy War. Plus, he was an assistant director to Macross Zero. The other two directors that, when I looked up, appear to be credited for the series are Hideki Tonokatsu and Hiroyuki Tanaka. You might know Hideki Tonokatsu for directing a Lupin the Third special called The One Dollar War, also known as Missed by a Dollar. As for Hiroyuki Tanaka, he also directed Claymore and an assistant director for Chobits. Some of the other roles the dub voice actors were in includes Crispin Freeman, who you might recognize as Giome Himejima in Demon Slayer, Red Arrow and Young Justice, and Kurei Foresight in the anime movie Promare. Patrick Seitz, who also did the voice of Scorpion in Mortal Kombat 9 and 10, along with the direct-to-video film Scorpion's Revenge and the recent Battle of the Realms, Jiren in Dragon Ball Super, and Endeavor in My Hero Academia. Lastly, with the dub cast that I'll mention, we have Yuri Lowenthal, who you might know as the voice of Sasuke Uchiha from the Naruto franchise, Suzaku Kurugi in Code Geass, and Sibon in Gurren Lagann. As for the Japanese cast, we have Joji Nakata, who played Nayata, I hope I pronounced the character's name correctly, from Log Horizon, Reaver, or if you want to go by the English version, Lever from Akame Ga Kill, and Albert Wesker in a few of the Resident Evil games, as well as the Marvel vs. Capcom series. Fumiko Orikasa, who portrayed Ruki Makino, or if you want to go by the English version, Rika Nonaka from Digimon Tamers, Riza Hawkeye from Fuma Alchemist Brotherhood, and Lote from Little Witch Academia. The last person I'll mention is Hiraki Hirata, who some of you might recognize as the voice of Virgil in the Devil May Cry series, Leomon in the Digimon franchise, Sanji in One Piece, and Klein in Sword Art Online. Overall, it goes without saying, Helsing Ultimate is completely insane. But by God, is it entertaining to watch. Plus, I would personally say it's considerably better than the original anime for a multitude of reasons. For something that was done by three different studios, the animation is very good with very little dip in quality. The voice work from the Japanese version, and especially the English dub, is excellent, and it's fun to watch. As far as a recommendation goes, this is a series where you have to know what you're getting into. Like I said, it's extremely violent, and if you can't stomach over-the-top blood or gore, if you want a more deep and or thought-provoking story, or even if vampires aren't your thing, then I seriously doubt this series will be for you, nor do I think it'll win you over to that genre. But if you're okay with all that, and just want a fun series to watch, it's definitely worth streaming, if not buying a copy, just because of sheer entertainment value. Currently, you can view it legally on Funimation's streaming service, and if you prefer sub-only Hulu, but both require a monthly fee. I give Helsing Ultimate an 8 out of 10, because even with the small issues I do have with this series, the entertainment value is just too high to overlook. This has been Michael Schomer, and not only do I hope you all have a nice day, and if you can, please get vaccinated, but also, if you want to see reviews before they are made public, then visit my website at michaelshomerreviews.com. And if you want to request something for a future review, then visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash shomes.